Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. You're listening to the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast. Catch us live weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts or watch us live on YouTube. All right. Well, one stock that's down about 50 percent is B. Riley. Uh, it's facing a wider probe on some risk disclosure. disclosure. So we want to get a little bit more into this with David uh, Viracos. He is Bloomberg legal reporter. Can you just explain to me, David, what's going on here, what this probe is? Uh, the Security and Exchange Commission has been investigating for several months uh, the accuracy of the financial disclosures from B. Riley, which is a Los Angeles-based investment firm, and we reported this morning that they're also looking into whether they've adequately disclosed the risk in some of the assets, uh, and they're looking at possible improper trading by insiders as well. Uh, The company today announced that it's likely to uh, miss its earnings um, by a good bit, and uh, so I think the uh, poor earnings announcement uh, combined with the SEC news oh, is boy, uh, punishing the shares. Yeah. Down 50%, down 84% over the trailing uh, 12 months. So that really does suggest that the stock market um, is really concerned about this thing. Is there a solution here? Is there a restructuring out there? Is there just, is there something out there that can save this company and shareholders and bondholders, I guess? Well, that's the question. I mean, Bryant Riley, the founder and CEO, said today that they're refocusing uh, their business on their core operations. And I guess we'll see uh, how investors react. Uh, Their problem is they have a lot of uh, problematic debt that they're going to have to work through now. And um, they also, uh, it's unknown just the precise nature of their relationship uh, with a guy named Brian Kahn, who uh, B. Riley helped uh, take his company franchise group public and then helped him take it private. And so there's a lot of interlocking relationships between the two of them. And there's a criminal investigation that's caught up Brian Kahn. So why would anyone own the stock right now? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I mean, what what what's in it for investors to hold on to the stock? Like, how soon will this legal worries be resolved or not? Like, how drawn out could this be? Um, it The company is contracting pretty rapidly. If you look at its market share, it's down considerably. So this could go quickly. Um, and I guess it's a matter of whether investors still have faith in this company to write itself. You know, I mean, just looking at, uh, you know, when you think about these investors banks, these brokerage firms, it's in the marketplace, it's all about trust. We saw that with Mm -hmm. Lehman Brothers, Bear Stearns, much bigger firms. Um, But if you lose that counterparty trust, you're done. You're done. Everybody just walks away from you. Is is that kind of, it feels like we're kind of at that point right now. It it does feel like we're at an inflection point, uh, you know, whether investors will continue to trust. And um, so um, I guess we'll have to see how the uh, investigations play out as well. All right, David, thank you very much for that reporting. It looks like a, a brutal day for B. Riley and its shareholders down 50% here. David Voriakos, uh, Bloomberg legal reporter, talking to us about B. Riley. R I L Y uh, is the ticker. You're listening to the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast. Catch us live weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Malik Steele, Paul Sweeney will be back momentarily. This is Bloomberg Intelligence Radio. We bring you all the top news in business and finance and economics through our lens of our Bloomberg Intelligence folks. They cover 2,000 companies and 130 industries worldwide. We also take you outside the Bloomberg Intelligence universe to get the read on what people are doing with their money. And for that, we go to Christina Hooper, a chief global market strategist at Invesco. She joins us now. Christina, you're one of the best about putting situations in the market into context and into perspective. So just let's start broad. How would you categorize the last couple of weeks within the within the market? So Alex, I would characterize it this way. We have seen valuations get stretched. 
let's face it, we've seen a very, very strong rally over multiple, multiple months without much of a pullback. So it makes sense that when stocks are closer to being priced for perfection, jitters enter uh, the market environment especially when we see some cracks appearing in the economy at the same time that the Fed is holding rates at very high levels, what I would argue is very restrictive given the level of disinflationary progress we've seen thus far. So I think of it as something of a small but almost perfect storm that caused a sell-off. Um, certainly, that was the case in the United States, of course, greatly exacerbated and initially triggered by what happened in Japan with the carry trade. Um, the Bank of Japan gave a somewhat surprising rate hike, and that uh, triggered an unwind. And uh, so we had a, a several different events that came together to cause the sell-off. But just as quickly as that occurred, we saw a, a retracing of much of it because those proximate causes dissipated. And by that, I mean, we heard from the Bank of Japan that in fact, they're gonna be a lot more cautious with any more rate hikes if there is market turmoil or instability. And number two, um, we got a, a data point in labor, the initial jobless claims that was better than expected because in the US, the trigger of course, for concerns about a, um, a heightened uh, probability of recession came from the July jobs report uh, and that increase in unemployment. So um, we've seen something of a, re a recovery. Uh, I think we're going to continue to see investors walking on eggshells in the near term because there's still a lot of uncertainty out there. But I think it definitely was an oversold situation. So then how does that set us up into CPI this week? Although I might say initial jobless claims before CPI, for example, more important. And then Jackson Hole. If positioning is kind of cleaned out a little bit, if we've kind of delevered enough, um, if technically we've already sort of uh, stabilized, how does that set us up? So I think we certainly will have jitters around uh, not just initial jobless claims, but clearly CPI. But we have to take it with a grain of salt, right? Because we are seeing other signs of disinflation. In fact, in fact, I thought the most important data point from the July jobs report was wage growth, mm -hmm. which has fallen to 3.6% year over year. But certainly we'll have markets hypersensitive to the data this week, uh, especially CPI. And then, of course, we'll have a lot of sensitivity around Jackson Hole. Now, I look to history and say that typically that is used as an opportunity for central bankers to signal shifts in monetary policy. And I would expect that to happen at Jackson Hole. Not in every speech, but I think we should get some sense that the Fed will cut in September. Now, I don't think we're going to get an emergency cut before then. Mm -hmm. and I don't think we're going to get a cut bigger than 50 basis points because the Fed seems to be very confident in their approach. And keep in mind, they were did a similar thing back in 2022. Many thought they were behind. Mm -hmm. um, I think they thought they might be behind, but they still only started um, with 25 basis points. And I think we'll see the same in September. So to that point, how does the Fed signal cuts when the market's already pricing in 100 basis points of cuts? So it's like if they go too far, then all of a sudden we're going to be looking at what, 50 again are being priced in. Well, I think it's, it's um, a reiteration that we're going to be gradual. Um, that we are going to start cutting, but don't expect it to be at, at the level you think it is, uh, because we're very comfortable with where the economy is right now, although monetary policy is too restrictive. So I think that's going to be the approach. So um, certainly not, um, not hawkish, but not the dovishness that markets are pricing in at this point. Do you feel then, from that perspective, that the carry trade unwind blow up thing that we saw is that over because the funny thing is if the fed cuts more than we think that's actually worse for the carry trade blow up um do we think that that part of the market turmoil is done i think it's largely done okay. um i wouldn't say it's it's entirely um but i do take comfort in the reassurances from the bank of japan and frankly i don't think they need to hike again for some time. Um, but yeah, certainly there could be wrenches thrown into it if the Fed, for example, is more dovish. I just don't see that on mm -hmm. the very near term horizon. All right, fair enough. Um, what do you think we are going to see for CPI on Wednesday? 
I think we'll probably see it somewhat in line with expectations, but I always take a step back and say, okay, let's say that the month over month number is higher than than we'd want to see. At the end of the day, the Fed is looking at a mosaic of data. And more important to the Fed, of course, is core PCE. And also, I think we often overlook that an important part of the Fed's calculus is consumer inflation expectations. We'll get the Michigan numbers on Friday. And I think that plays a role. Keep in mind that back in June of 2022, when the Fed decided to hike rates uh, 75 basis points rather than 50, they gave as their argument in the press conference a couple of different data points that they had received, not just CPI, but inflation expectations. So I think that's an important part of the calculus. That's a, it's such a good point. And it's also like the trend, you know, the directionality uh, to be important there too. So when my husband texts me and says, oh my gosh, look at this market, what are we doing here? We have to do something. What do I tell him? Like, calm down, stay in your positions. Or are we going to buy the dip here? Like, how do you deal with it as a market participant? Well, I look at it this way. If we had been smart enough to turn off uh, our Bloomberg terminals, <laughs> this not is so that true. I could do that, but, if, <laughs> but and turned at, turned on the TV and just watched the Olympics since the start, <laughs> and then turned back everything on today, it wouldn't seem like anything dramatic, very dramatic, had happened while we were enjoying the Olympics, including the breakdancing section. And <laughs> yet, um, that is not what we as humans tend to do. We fixate on every move and every data point. So I think to a certain extent, putting blinders on and thinking about the long-term trajectory of where inflation is going, where the Fed is going, can be helpful. Uh, I think we get so caught up in the short-term data and market moves when we often, as investors, you know, we typically have much longer time horizons. It's true. It's such a good point. I knew the double double tasking here. Well, on my terminal with my little TV up on the screen was the right call. Thank you for validating me, uh, Christina. So does that mean that it's still going to be sort of growth though, or quality? Maybe you go with quality. Quality uh, over cyclicals or something? Is, is that a good way to also think about it? Well, probably in the near term, it's going to be quality because mm -hmm. there is a nervousness. There still is some risk off sentiment, even though I think uh, certainly conditions became oversold. Um, having said all that, if the Fed begins to cut and we start to see an improvement in economic data, then I think there's this assumption on the part of markets that there will be a reacceleration. That's my base case. Mm -hmm. And we'll see in my opinion, markets anticipate that in advance, discount that in advance, which would mean small caps and cyclicals are likely to outperform. All right, Christina, did you did you like break dancing? Like, how do we feel about that in the Olympics? There's no one else will talk about this with me in radio. How did you feel about it? Well, I was very curious about it. I have to say that's something that I think of fondly as as a child of the 80s. Um, <laughs> but I'm not sure I've seen breakdance moves like the ones I saw at the Olympics, so I didn't know if there were different rules in place. This is fair enough. John Tucker has something he wants to say. Is it a say. sport? No, it's it's not a whatever. Is skate? Do you think skateboarding is a sport? Yes. Okay, so what's the difference? Because uh, they're on a board. Ah, uh, okay. I don't know. I, I don't know about that. I, I loved it. I'm so sad it's over. You're All right, turning Christina. me into a curmudgeon, by the way. I, I'm not turning you into anything. Yes, you are. I'm just it's setting you fault. up with certain questions. All right, <laughs> Christina, thanks a lot. We appreciate it. Christina Hooper, uh, Chief Global Market Strategist at Invesco. To be totally fair to John Tucker, I'm not entirely clear on the breakdancing thing either, but I support winners, and that's all fine. You're listening to the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast. Catch us live weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts or watch us live on YouTube. The headline in a good way is Scotia Bank buying about 14.9% of Key Corp for about $2.8 uh, billion. Now, remember, Key Corp was one of the re regional banks that was hit pretty hard in the tumult of 2023. So naturally, who do we go to? Herman Chan, Bloomberg Intelligence Senior Analyst for U.S. regional banks. Usually we call on him when things are going poorly, but this feels to be a good thing for Key Corp. Um, can you walk us through... Let's walk us through what Key Corp actually was before uh, Scotiabank decided to get in here. Sure. So Key Corp, regional bank based in Ohio, Cleveland, uh, strong presence uh, in commercial lending and has a really robust uh, investment bank and capital markets capability for its size. Uh, on the flip side, uh, the bank uh, 
was really has been really pressured by the higher interest rate environment. It got caught off sides a little bit by both its hedging strategy and its investments in low yielding securities when interest rates were near zero. Um, so its its margin and profitability has lagged the peer group over the past couple of years. Um, that being said, uh, things were improving and, and didn't require any additional capital infusion. Uh, there was on a path to uh, self-help. Uh, it, margin had already reached the bottom, but now the with the 2.8 billion capital infusion from Scotiabank, they can accelerate that that uh, earnings profitability improvement story. How long does it take to get something like this done? Like, has this been in the works for a while or what? Yeah, it seems like uh, uh, based on both the calls that, that Key Corp and Scotiabank conducted earlier this morning, uh, the CEOs had ongoing conversations about um, a, a potential investment. Uh, from what I understand, Scotiabank wanted to expand in the U.S. Uh, and, and had done a lot of due diligence in, in looking at opportunities, and Keyport was their top choice. Mm -hmm. um, so to, uh, it adds um, a, you know, a great earning stream and, and exposure to the U.S. for Scotiabank. And for Keycorp, it really improves its capital and liquidity and really puts them on offense rather than playing defense for the past couple of years. How are the banks like Keycorp doing um, as interest rates may fall somewhat soon? <laughs> yeah, um, I guess I would contrast it with the tumult of uh, March and April of last year. Um, the, the banks had largely been very defensive, um, uh, pretty much up to the end of last year, reducing its lending capacity, trying to improve its capital and liquidity ahead of both uh, fears about deposits leaving and also higher regulatory uh, burden. Um, right now, it seems like they, they, they're they in a much stronger position. Capital has been, been built up. Um, they're back to lending. The only issue is there's not a lot of demand. Mm -hmm. And um, the banks are positioned for, for potentially lower interest rates. Um, that can improve um, some lending going forward. Um, they've hedged a lot of the potential rate decline. Mm -hmm. So they're in a fairly good position to, to really uh, prosecute the, the opportunity. Um, what about deposits? Mm -hmm. Have de Has deposit flight stopped, um, particularly if rates wind up coming down? I'm just waiting for my markets account to all of a sudden start to tick lower uh, on yield. It, it, yeah. wh where are we here with that? My, my high yield savings account is al already ticked down oh in anticipation God. for rate cuts. So American <laughs> Express, I'm not a big fan of that. Um, I would say that deposits have really stabilized. Um, there's no real rush to build deposits now because, as I said before, there's not a lot of demand for the lending side so you don't need a lot of deposits to really fuel that that you know the the muted demand appetite out there for loans um that being said the the deposit cards aren't rising either um and they're pretty stable because um, the feds uh, stabilized the, the fed funds rate for for a bit now and um we'd expect you know some stable margin uh, depending on the bank some could be up some could be down over the next year just based on their balance sheets are there other um, potential targets for investments from other banks in this kind of scenario? Yeah, from what I understand, that there's a, a unique way of accounting for the the Canadians, uh, where where uh, some a small portion of uh, investments in financial institutions has a as a positive uh, capital calculation so it might be more focused on the canadians in general but that being said that we have seen some pickup in, in traditional m a activity in the united states uh, discover capital one is the biggest one that we're still waiting for regulatory regulatory approval on. And then there's some smaller banks that have done some deals as well. So it seems like um, that the, the activity is going to rebound even more once we get rate cuts. All right. Really good stuff. Thank you so much, Herman Chan. Uh, he is so happy when he comes in and he doesn't have to talk about banks blowing up. So, exactly. You know, we I'm no that. longer the Grim Reaper. So no, I'm, I'm happy no, about you're that. not. It was like Sam Fazelli for a while with COVID. Then it was Herman Chan with the bank blow up. And now, you know, we're in a different place. Herman Chan, Bloomberg Intelligence, senior analyst for U.S. regional banks. We very much uh, appreciate that. You're listening to the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast. Catch us live weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130.
and Alex Steele, Paul Sweeney, live here in our Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio, also streaming video on YouTube. So head over to youtube.com and search Bloomberg Podcast. That's where you will find us. Boy, if you think back a week ago, right now, the market was panicking, it felt like. I mean, people were selling everything across the board, and there's a real confluence of events there that really spooked the market. Uh, the market stabilized kind of midday and into, into the afternoon on Monday, and then kind of clawed back uh, some of that uh, selling uh, later in the week, which brings us to today, kind of a, a mixed market, red and green on the screen here. But let's see where we go from here. And we do that with a professional, Sarah Ponzik, financial advisor, UBS Private Wealth Management. Full disclosure, that's where the Sweeney pile of cash is at mm -hmm. UBS. Yeah. So they have a whole wing just taking care of me. Oh, basically. that's nice. That's yes, nice. exactly. I mean, I've heard of that. I've yeah. heard of Paul that. Sweeney ring, exactly. wing, the PTS wing. <laughs> Tony sure. OC, he does it just because he, he, <laughs> he likes me. Um, all right, Sarah, what were you, what kind of conversations were you having with your clients last week? It must have been, Monday must have been a little dicey. It, it was. And what a difference just a couple of days makes. Yeah. On Monday, if you woke up and you looked at the headlines and you saw what had happened overseas, and then you looked at futures markets, and then the market opened at 9.30 a.m., and it was just a sea of red. It felt like the world was falling apart, and I did. I mean, I, I had incoming calls all day long from clients asking, what is going on? Do we need to be concerned? Should we be selling our stock portfolio? And the answer was emphatically no, because as we saw by the end of the week, what a difference a couple of days makes. Yeah. And if we think back to why, why did Monday happen last week? There was a confluence of events. Yes, we saw the yen carry trade unwinding. It was, you know, just more concerns about recession post that jobs report. Um, and just also consider the fact that we had seen almost no volatility this year. We were, we were due for some volatility. Um, and then it just took a couple of days, an initial jobless claims report, which showed maybe the labor market isn't as dire as the prior Friday had really suggested, which usually doesn't move markets, but it did. And then by the end of the week, if you had fallen asleep the entire week, you would have never known Monday happened because the S&P 500 was unchanged by the end I of the week. I so wish that I had done that. <laughs> I, I could, sleeping is my superpower. I could definitely have done that for like a whole week. Um, so, Sarah, I guess the question then, so if someone says, oh, my gosh, I'm panicking. Do I change what I do? You're like, no, just hang tight. But can you rotate kind of within that and take advantage then of some of the opportunity that uh, came about? Absolutely. Last week presented opportunity. So especially if you're someone who's been sitting on cash and it's been great. You can sit in a money market. You're earning, you know, five and a half percent in cash. Fantastic. But now we're closer than ever to really believing that that's not going to be the case mm -hmm. in quite some time. We're going to see interest rates coming down. So what do you want to do with that cash? Obviously, if you're conservative, you could go buy high, high quality fixed income. Mm -hmm. But last week really presented an opportunity in the stock market. If you were someone who's been waiting for an entry port, entry point, last Monday presented that self. You know, start putting that cash to work, getting invested, putting a plan in place to get invested in the equity market. And when you think about certain pockets of the market, I mean, we just saw tech get absolutely hammered mm -hmm. last week. And tech is still a place that we're really still optimistic about. And if you look at US tech valuations, Last month, they were trading around 32 times 12-month forward earnings. Now they're down to around 27. So more reasonable and, again, an opportunity to get invested in a place that had been so high-flying. And many were just scared to chase returns in the beginning of the year. So aside from technology, which, again, a lot of folks are saying stick with it, stick with it, um, how, where else do you guys see opportunities out there? Because, there are, again, a lot of people that are thinking about if interest rates are coming down, this might be a time for me to think about doing take on more risk perhaps. yes absolutely so we've still been very much pushing at, at the top of our list i would say high quality growth which you know at the top of that list is tech but when you think about more so tactical trades maybe looking to small caps mm -hmm. you know we did see a big rotation to small caps in july when we started thinking about interest rates potentially coming down when we think about interest rates moving lower mm -hmm. small caps are going to be that prime beneficiary of that they have a lot of debt on their balance sheets but at the same time if you're someone who is concerned about a recession. And I will say for now, a soft landing is still our base case. But in the case of a recession, small caps is, small caps is really not where you want to be overweight. So finding that balance, but small caps potentially. And then also you can look at some other cyclical industries like industrials. If we do start to see, you know, 
growth continue to move forwards, interest rates come down, maybe balancing out that high growth exposure with a little bit of cyclicality. But again, if we do see more concerns that a recession might be on the horizon, cyclicals and small caps, that's where it can get a little bit dicey. It was interesting, though. I'm just looking at a one-month comp chart of uh, the S&P and the Russell, and they, they didn't really diverge that much. Like, small caps didn't tank in mm-hmm. relation to the S&P. They sort of moved in tandem. Today, they're a little bit off, uh, maybe a little bit more than, yeah, but, like, not that much. No. It really was, when we think about the rotation we saw in July, it was a one-week major snap in which we saw small caps outperform. And now, like like you mentioned, Alex, mm-hmm. we really haven't seen a continuation of that. And we are actually of the belief, look, you should have diversification. You should have a little bit of small caps, mid caps in your portfolio. But when we think about where where is really where are we going to see the bulk of the growth and the bulk of returns and outperformance in the years to come, we still believe that's high quality growth, large cap tech, in large part because look, we went from talking about great economic projections to talking about maybe a recession. And frankly, if there are recession concerns, where do people go? They want high quality. They Mm -hmm. want growth. They want earnings. And nowadays, that has become mega cap tech. So we still are optimistic there. Yes, you want diversification, but we're not huge proponents of a major rotation just quite yet. All right. You're in South Florida. Seems like everybody and her brother's coming down there. Yep. What to be is fair, it? she's from there. So oh, you're that's, a local. That's actually what I say all the time, Alex. Is look, <laughs> I did. I moved down to Florida, 2021, when the entire world was moving right. to Florida. Everyone's still moving there, but I say in defense, look, I was here first. I grew up here. <laughs> yeah. I promise, I'm not an outsider. So. <laughs> is it still? Is it? Are they still coming? Do you think? I mean, I know you and your office and all the other folks down there are welcoming everybody down. But. It's I. Look, it's, it's not 2021, 2022 anymore. It's definitely slowed. Even if you look at the real estate market by us, prices haven't come down, but they are not you know, sky, continuing to skyrocket right. at ridiculous, ridiculous paces. So I would say yes, every now and then, I'm still meeting people on the street who say, oh, I just moved here from New York. I just moved here oh, from New Jersey. <laughs> I just moved here from California all of the time. But it, it has slowed from, you know, the breakneck pace at which we were seeing just a couple of there's years like ago. All those stories that like there's not enough schools, like not enough private schools, not enough highways for all the traffic. Like I know. Is, is that know, a thing? Yes. There's, oh, my gosh. Traffic has gotten a lot worse. Um, and at the same time, anyone who has kids, not yet me. Um, <laughs> but thinking about if you're moving down here, you got to get your kid on wait lists for school. Public schools are all overcrowded. Uh, if you're trying to get, you know, a young child into daycare, they're the first person you have to tell that you might be having a child because, you know, you have to get on the yeah. wait list. Oh my God. All my neighbors are telling me this. Um, but yeah, no, it's it's it's, it's real. definitely it's different. Real. It's very real. All those stories that you hear, they they come from a place of truth. <laughs> it's just you wonder. I mean, how long that economy can support all that. I mean, I, I, I wonder the same. No, we, we have seen a slowing. It's it's not the same, but and and we're still welcoming people down there. Now, so. what's up with Florida taxes? Like, you don't pay a lot of taxes. No, inc- no state income taxes. So where does right. state at some point, doesn't that change? Because where does you got to, st- like, build the stuff, like, yeah. more schools. Where does the state and- get its revenue? Property taxes are higher. Okay. Mm-hmm. okay. So there are higher property taxes, um, you know, real estate taxes. But, uh-huh. yeah, no state income tax, w- of which I would also say, you know, I have a lot of clients up here. That's why I'm in studio today. I'm right. here visiting clients. A lot of people trying to change residency for that very reason. Really? So it's a definitely a factor that comes into play, um, you know, with the allure so of that's the Florida why, draw. That's why if you're a financial advisor like Sarah, you have to be up on the municipal bond market. Oh, municipal yeah. bond, oh See, we're going to get uh, Alex into the municipal bond market. Um, hey, here. man, I have to handle all those segments when you're out on Friday. <laughs> I, I start sending prep messages uh, to our producer. Great tax-free right income, before. Alex. Great tax-free income. I know. Income. It just it hurts my brain. Um, <laughs> but before we let you go, though, I had a question about the cash. So money market fund cash, right? Yes. That's sitting there. You're like, 5%, that's going to go away. Is there like a level where you guys think about where you're like, if it hits 3%, that's when the cash really moves? Like I've been thinking about that with, say, my high-yield savings account. That, that is a good question. I don't know if there's really a level in which people are going to say, oh my gosh, now I need to start moving cash. I think that mentality, that psychological shift needs to start happening now because mm-hmm. look, interest rates are going to come down. We more so think about it, especially if you're someone who's living off of your portfolio. Think of it, okay, how much are you spending every year off your portfolio? Maybe you still want to keep that in cash or cash like securities like a CD or a treasury bill. So you know that even if there's volatility in the market, You don't have to sell your stocks at a discount. You're not worried about that. You have enough cash on hand. Anything beyond that, unless you have something that that cash is earmarked for, you 
probably want to get that invested. So in a typical you know, UBS account that, that you handle, have your clients been holding more cash because they, in fact, can make a decent return? I would say yes over the last year. Right. Um, we've been trying to encourage them to get invested. And most of the time, look, we like to put an entire plan in place and say, look, especially if you're someone, look, we work, we work with a lot of business owners. Okay. If you come at a liquidity event and all of a sudden you have a lot of cash on hand, that's scary. Right. You had control over your business. You don't have control over the capital markets. How do you think about investing that? Mm -hmm. So it's not as though you are going to go ahead and you're going to get all of that cash invested in a month. You're going to take time to get that invested, but maybe locking in yields and fixed income now before yields come down. And then on the stock side, figuring out how much risk are you comfortable with and maybe dollar cost averaging over six months, 12 months, even 18 months, depending on your risk tolerance. But that's really where the psycholo psychological shift takes place. When you go from running a business where you have so much control mm -hmm. over your income to all of a sudden being subject to volatility in the capital markets, right. it's working through that change. Interesting. All right, Sarah, thank you so much for joining us. Always great to see you. Sarah's a former uh, reporter here at uh, Bloomberg Now. She's, She's the doing best. I, I haven't seen you since Kaylee's wedding, That's have I? No. Right? In person. I just wow. saw Kaylee. She's in town just for the day, so I was so lucky yeah. I got to say hi. <laughs> All right, great. Sarah Ponsek. Yeah. She's a financial advisor at UBS Private Wealth Management uh, down there in Boca Raton, Florida. I yeah, mean, I guess and? it's hot in the summer. But well, well, why do you it's go to California here. from to Florida? Well, no They're like the same I, for me, no? No. No. <laughs> No, weather wise no ta yeah, it's, uh, it's the, the taxes the weather in california is not warm i guess that's true unless you're inland and then it's crazy hot yeah but on the coast it's cool they have instead of having fog you know what they have uh. marine layer marine layer that's what they call it. it's not fog it's a marine layer that's how they do it in san diego huh. Good Car to see it's carmel it's just fog so we'll see you're listening to the bloomberg intelligence podcast catch us live weekdays at 10 a.m eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Bloomberg Intelligence Radio. We are live from the Interactive Broker Studio right here in Midtown Manhattan. Also check us out uh, on YouTube. The Big Take Story are always the best stories. They dig into different topics that not only Wall Street, but also Main Street can kind of sink their teeth into. And today's big story, a uh, big take story, is no different. The title is Hedge Funds Smell Blood as Lenders Turn on Each Other. The title was so good, I read the whole piece before I even knew I was doing this segment. Uh, Eliza Ronalds uh, Hannon joins us. She's senior debt reporter, and she's standing by. So, Eliza, before we get into the nuts and bolts of the story, the way I think of it is, okay, you're a company, you need money, you go, you go to lenders, you take out some loans, and there's a there's a capital structure, and that's it. And if I default, then the person on the bottom end of the capital structure doesn't get a money, doesn't get the money, or or gets a reduced payment, and that's normal, right? That's not where we are anymore in this world. No, it's not. It's like the the security that you thought you once enjoyed as a lender, especially a secured lender or a top priority lender just kind of can disappear right before your eyes these days. And that's because the lender protections on these leveraged loans or high yield bonds has just eroded over a decade of high competition for the higher yielding paper in the market um, in a bid to get a chunk of some of those rare, really nice high yielding loans. Investors have agreed to waive all sorts of terms and protections that once put them in the position to be able to say, not so fast, you know, I basically own you now. Which is really crazy because then it also opens the door to then a company going to all its different creditors, right? And trying to strike different deals. Can you walk me through that part? Right. So what happens is the company needs often at least a majority of bare majority of lenders to agree to pulling some of these maneuvers like stripping assets from the collateral package of one loan and moving them into a new unrestricted subsidiary in order to all of a sudden have new collateral that it can raise debt against. So it goes to lenders and says, hey, if you agree to this, um, you know, you and a few friends who all together hold 51% of this loan, sometimes it's a higher percentage, we will let you actually skip ahead of the rest in the new capital structure. We'll let you, for instance, be the funds who can put in the new debt that we're asking for, which will be backed by the old assets that you used to think you already had as collateral. And for that reason, you actually won't have to write off this whole investment. You'll have another chance at 
collecting even more yield and, and eventually getting repaid on everything. So how do hedge funds come in on this then? Well, the hedge funds have, you know, distressed investors are no stranger to underhanded tactics or kind of just rough um, strategies. But nevertheless, you have sort of seen them go through stages of grief, it seems, with regard to this new order. So um, in the beginning, some were in denial. You saw them say, not my not my company, not my private equity sponsor. They wouldn't do me like that. Um, and as it's happened even more and more, they started saying, okay, we need to go on the defensive. We need to organize to, you know, almost protest that this that this happened and say, uh, already, you know, 60% of us have gotten together and said, we're not going to work with you. And so you can't actually pull this off. And that's, we talk about in the story, that's the co-op agreement phenomenon. But others are now saying, forget defensive, we need to get a offensive. And so they are piling up um, on cash so that when indeed the company does say whoever here can give us new money we're going to put you in the prime position and you can kick all your peers down in the repayment line you know we're going to give you the actual the new claim to that collateral um, as long as you top us off with some new financing so the way to play this new phenomenon well and win is to always have cash on hand that you can say hey Put me in the best position and I'll give you a little more financing. Man, this makes my head hurt. I mean, this is a dumb question, but if I'm a senior debt lender, why do I want to get involved in this at all? If I don't know, if I could go to bed one night and feel very secure in my investment and the next morning wake up and have like 30 cents on the dollar, like why would I even do that? Well, you kind of don't have a choice. There's not anywhere else to go in the market up until now to get those high returns that will you know keep you employed as a portfolio manager or keep you getting new money in it's a little bit of a you know immediacy bias that you want you're only looking to the next quarter or the quarter after that you need to be churning out these high yields for your investors to stay happy and you really are just kind of crossing your fingers and hoping hoping it doesn't come to your company but then when it yes. does these liability management exercises, so they're called, or the instances of violence are often designed to actually give the company another chance at a turnaround. So if the obstacles to the company are a bit macroeconomic based um, or, you know, supply demand, there's some sort of phenomenon that's not um, totally secular, they say, you know what? we can take on a little bit more of an interest burden. And if we can just get to next year when all of a sudden this or that regulation will change, this company can actually turn it yeah. around. We avoid filing for bankruptcy and then everything will work out fine. So, you know, the hedge fund managers who go to sleep and decide to keep investing in this are kind of feeling like they don't have anywhere else to turn to generate the yields that they need to generate. How many of those companies actually do survive though? That's the important question. And so, some of that data is really trickling out now, and we do analyze it in the story. Um, some of them survive, but you, we have seen increasingly the companies that do one of these exercises in, say, 2021. By 2023, they ended up having to file for bankruptcy anyway. Hmm. And that's where you see, you, you might think that that means the whole exercise was meaningless, but in a way it becomes all the more meaningful because that's where the removal of collateral or, or the transfer of, of collateral really becomes relevant because in a bankruptcy and say the company's getting liquidated or even if it's not all those creditors got pushed down and their collateral was taken away from them they're recovering zero cents on the dollar or one or two or three cents we show in a chart mm -hmm. and those who leapfrog them by putting in new capital they come out pretty well they get 90 cents on the dollar 95 70 just you see the devastating impact that the original asset shift has on creditors when all is said and done and the company needs to hand out its assets in order to give people recoveries. Eliza, really appreciate it. I also heard it's your day off and you're doing this anyway. That shows dedication. Thank you, <laughs> Thank Thank you, you very much, Eliza Ronald Hannon, a senior debt reporter. Really great story. It's today's big take. You can check it out. You can read more of this story on the Bloomberg and at Bloomberg.com slash big take. Again, uh, that headline, hedge funds smell blood as lenders turn on each other. Definitely go ahead 
and check that out. This is the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast, available on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. Listen live each weekday, 10 a.m. to noon Eastern on Bloomberg.com, the iHeartRadio app, tune in, and the Bloomberg Business app. You can also watch us live every weekday on YouTube and always on the Bloomberg Terminal.